when you hear the term teacher centered leadership, what does that make you think about? When I was having this conversation with Dr. Christopher Jones, he is writing a book on this concept. And I think it's really important because sometimes when we think about this, it's about an administrator that always has our back, always supportive. And I think that's part of it. I think that's a really important aspect. But is it one that pushes us? Is it one who mentors us to get better? And I've had the opportunity to connect with so many educators from all over the world. And sometimes they reach out to me and they'll talk to me about really struggling at their school. And they're not struggling because they're having a hard time in their classroom or having a hard time at their job. Um, and maybe their performance isn't that great. They're having a hard time because they feel they're no longer growing, that they're actually ready to move on to something else. And sometimes the advice I give them is that you have to go. Like you need to go to a place where you're going to find someone who pushes you because it is so important that we have people's backs, but that we're actually helping them grow through the process, which is also very important in our classrooms as well. If we create a space where kids come into our classrooms, they already know everything they need to know that we're teaching that year. Why would they even show up? And so how do we create that space for our kids where they know they're supported, they know they're cared for, but we're also helping them grow. And is that something we ask for ourselves? So I really appreciated this conversation with, with Dr. Chris Jones. And we had a, a great conversation about this concept, about this idea. We talked a little bit about some old school wrestling from when we were kids at the end of the podcast. And I always like to have some of those personal connections because I think making those personal connections is something that I try to embody, not only in this podcast, but I think it's really important that I model that because I think it's so crucial to what we do in education. I know you're going to love this podcast. Uh, Dr. Jones has some great ideas. Whenever I say Dr. Jones, I think of Indiana Jones, to be honest. Yeah. But um, it's a great podcast. I know you're going to love it. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I am really excited to actually have Dr. Chris Jones on the podcast. And we just kind of connected over email, connected through social media, and uh, had a little time to do one podcast, a little conversation. We got into some, probably by no choice of your own, we got into like some WWF wrestling, some old school stuff. I don't know, maybe yeah. that will pop up in the podcast, but I don't want, I actually maybe mentioned it to get it out of the way because... I could do like an hour about wrestling with you probably. Um, so Dr. Jones is currently a principal in Massachusetts. And I'm, am I like, is that how you say that? Do you say Massachusetts? Like, how do you Massachusetts. say Massachusetts? Massachusetts. I, where is it? Where is the T? Where is it? Like, cause it Massachusetts. No. All right. <laughs> no. Right? Massachusetts. No, oh, Massachusetts. Massachusetts. I would say Massachusetts. I see. We, see, like, we, we could do a half right? hour on how to say state names too. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, doc, Dr. Jones here, and I'm gonna, and he gave me permission to call him Chris. So I just want to make sure, because uh, I appreciate that. We, when we um, were talking, uh, one of the things that he, we talked about when we were kind of preparing for the show today is really kind of this focus on being teacher centered as an administrator. And something I really appreciate. And I, uh, I appreciate your perspective, and I can't wait to kind of dig into that because I know you got a book coming out on the concept. But uh, Chris, can you just kind of talk, tell us who you are? Tell us what you do now and kind of how you got to that point. Sure. Um, and and thanks. I'm really excited about having the chance to talk to you um, on this podcast. So um, my name's Chris Jones, as you heard. I, I'm a principal of a high school in Massachusetts, um, Whitman Hanson Regional High School. I'm the, I'm the proud principal of that high school. And I just entered my fourth year at this school. Um, prior to that, I was a principal at Seekonk High School for a couple of years and assistant principal before that for like eight years. So, I mean, you know, without continually going back, I started teaching in 2020. Um, so I'm, I've been in this, in this field for 21 years. And, uh, before that so I was 2000, a 2000, right? 2000, right? You meant 2000, yeah. not 2020. Yeah. 2000. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah I was like, it hasn't wow, been 20 years. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> they must That's have been hurting for principals. <laughs> Thanks for catching that. Um, <laughs> As I, I was right away, I was like, wow, it must be really hurt for principals. Yeah. You got someone time here. Moves, that... Time moves fast in Massachusetts. I love it. I love it. <laughs> I, um, so 2000, um, 
but uh, I was a coppersmith before that. So I was doing a lot of copper work um, on roofs and, and prefabrication installation, things like that. And my, um, my family um, kept telling me that I should go into teaching and become a teacher because I was giving tours to family members at Civil War battlefield sites, specifically uh, mostly Gettysburg and Antietam. And um, I said, well, you know, I, 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 I'll teach anybody anything if they're willing to learn, but I don't want to go and do all the classroom management stuff and things like mm -hmm. that, that I had experienced personally um, coming up through high school. And uh, I come from a family that is pretty much, you know, put up or shut up. Um, if you don't like something, do something about it to change it or stop complaining about it. And I'd always complained about my high school experience saying that I found myself yeah. incredibly bored and that there's, there's gotta be something better or a better way to do it. Um, so I got my first teaching job at an alternative high school. And I, I still remember that conversation where my mother said, you know, I, I'm sorry, you got a teaching job where, right. and I never looked back. I loved the challenge of it. And then I moved from there to a teaching job in an inner city, um, with all the different challenges that come with that. And then I went from there. I was my first year in administration. I was part-time assistant principal and part-time special education team chair. So that's about a, um, two full-time jobs wrapped into one. Mm -hmm. And, uh, then I stayed assistant principal and then, um, moved to another assistant principal and just got to the point where I moved up to be a principal. And that's, that's why I'm here. That's the quick version. Okay. I got to ask you this question. Cause I'm like, so, you know, you hear a lot of people kind of shifting from, you know, one profession to into education. I, I can honestly tell you coppersmith is not one that I've heard before. Right. So that, that is, that is a one that's unique. So like when you worked at that job um, and I'm curious, maybe there's nothing, but when you worked at that job, what are some of the things that you had as a coppersmith that you did, you know, in that profession that you would say like transferred over to you being an effective teacher? Like, what are some of the things that you kind of learn from that profession? Because I think a lot of times we think teaching is like only about teaching. And, and I'm like, well, actually it's about all, like, it's kind of about all things, right? Like there's obviously learning that you had to do in that job that has made yeah. you successful in education. So like, what, what is something that you kind of connect to those two, the, the two professions? Um, I think one of the things I would, or a couple, there is a couple of things that I pull over. One I think is discipline. Um, uh, in making sure that what I'm doing with a task is is what needs to be done to make sure that the outcome is good, um, because there's often little steps. Um, there's creativity because I had to be creative with some different things, and I and I also mm. taught when I was doing that. Um, I taught other people the craft, and so I would explain to people and and teach people that were working with me different things they had to do, and then. Um, I would also direct people that were when there were multiple people on the job sites and things like that. So um, that kind of coordination, um, mm -hmm. curiosity, creativity, and like you said, always learning. I was always learning something. I mean, you know, I, I had the opportunity to work with a couple people or under a couple people that were just fantastic at what they did. So I, I would always learn from them wherever I could. Yeah. And I think when you're, when, when we're looking at, you know, other professions outside of education, if we cannot make connections to that work, if we can't see that, then how do we get our kids to learn anything other than education? Right? Like, right. I think part of that too, is that we're trying to see, have kids make their own connections to learning, right? And going into, um, I know you, you'd mentioned when we were talking previously, you know, your own kids going into like uh, vocational schools, looking at that. And really, uh, that to me is like kind of the epitome of learning, right? There's things that you got to kind of go through that process and, and develop. And uh, there, there's things, you know, that I, I don't know if I would be able to learn in that profession, but I'm good in these aspects and things like that too. But I think we have to be really inclusive to like how there's learning in all aspects of careers and our lives and kind of how we make those connections. Um, you, know, you had mentioned, sorry, go ahead, Chris. I, I was just going to say, it's, it's interesting that you say that because, um, you know, we're, we're doing different things and we have uh, different guidance suites and where we do career clusters and job inventories and things like mm -hmm. that to, to determine the kid's interest. But unfortunately, a lot of times it stops there, right? So we, we do that and find out what they're interested in and then we move them on to other courses. And I had a, oh, I had a conversation with my uh, director of counseling. It's, yeah, it's kind of like, thanks for the info. Now I'll learn this. Um, right. 
but it's, it's, uh, I had a conversation with her because I told her, I said, you know, I don't, I don't really believe in this whole college and career readiness thing. At which point, you know, she looked at me like, what are you talking about? You're the principal. Um, I said, I, I'm a believer in career readiness. Um, some careers require college, others don't. Some require certification programs, some require skills with your hands, um, and different things like that. So I think it's, it's really important what you're saying to, to point out the idea that, yeah, it's great to identify what a kid's interested in and what a kid's good at, but then to just move along like, okay, we identified it, but not do anything with it. That's, that's right. a disservice. Then, then why even ask in the first place? So maybe it should be college and or career readiness. Right. Right. Or, and or like military should... and or, yeah. 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 Like, and or, you know, but life readiness is, I think, the most important aspect of that, too. Uh, you you make it a point, I think, I, something I've talked about quite a bit, is that I cannot stand when we're like, oh, we empowered student voice. And I'm like, did you? You just, you let them talk, but you ignored everything they said, right? So, like, yeah, hey, we, right, like, right. we got input from our students on how we could improve our school. And, like, that was awesome. It was so good to hear their thoughts. Okay, what'd you do about what they said? Oh, I don't know. That's, that's, that would be work. <laughs> it's like, well, yeah. it doesn't really matter. Like, it's like, it's like, hey, it's like, you know, I'm, I'm glad you shared that with me. And it's just kind of like the most condescending thing. I'm not going to do anything with it, but you got to talk. So there you go. Right. So I, I, right. I appreciate you, right. you, you, you kind of calling that out. Um, we were, we were talking um, earlier when we were, when they did the three questions podcast um, about, uh, administrators and maybe that you didn't really have one that you, you know, really had made the positive impact that, you know, I, I can honestly say I have been so blessed with some of the administrators that I've had. Uh, and really a lot of my work today is in honor to them, to be honest with you. Like I always wish I could have the impact that some of my administrators had on me. That That's kind of my goal. And, um, it, I think that your story is, is unfortunate, but it's not unique. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think a lot of people have had that experience. So that being said, um, you went from being a teacher to an assistant principal, as you just mentioned. So how did you, like, how did you be the administrator that maybe you didn't have as a teacher? What, like, what things did you focus on? You know, it's funny that you say that because I, I'm a firm believer in a lot of times we can learn more from what we don't want to do um, mm -hmm. than seeing what we do want to do. And mm -hmm. so I focused on trying to support teachers in risk taking. And this was kind of the beginning of where I got the whole idea of teacher centered and and the different things that I talk about for my book. Um, I, I have a story, if I could just take a second and tell a quick story, um, something that really stuck with me with one of my administrators is they told me they were going to come in and do an observation. And so I had this great lesson planned. I think it was like my second year. I had a fantastic lesson plan on the age of discovery where I brought all the kids into a bigger room with a bunch of furniture and stuff stored in there. They had sticky notes. I let, you know, Portugal go first. And then they could step back after they claimed all the important things and look and say, oh, well, this is why different nations had claimed a more territory um, throughout mm -hmm. exploration. It's great. It was engaging. They were all about it. We had a discussion afterwards. I ended up waiting and starting five minutes later than I wanted to because the administrator never showed up. So the administrator blew off the, the observation mm -hmm. and right. came the next day when we had the written assessment portion. And so the administrator walked in. I said, oh, well, we're just That's putting awesome. in writing we're writing some paragraphs and things like that. And uh, man, did I get did I get dinged up on that observation? The evaluation. I knew where that was we were going. I hated it. Yeah. Right, right. And so yeah. I I said, well, you, the day before when you're supposed to come, that's when that's when you would have seen a lot more interaction and engagement. And mm -hmm. I'll never forget this. This principal looked at me and said, well, you should have changed the lesson. Um, and I said, well, that would that would be an issue because then that's taking the learning out of sequence for the students and the students would struggle with the concept more. Right. And she said, well, you have to decide whether you want a good evaluation. Or you want the kids to be in sync with the concept that you're looking at. And I was like, uh, really? <laughs> you know? Oh, so, oh, um, so with that, you know, the idea of telling teachers and, and not so much doing all this announcing stuff, but going and I go in frequently to classrooms and give, give that smaller feedback stuff. But, but telling teachers, I don't want to see your class when it's all so well planned out and everything. I want to see what you're doing on a daily. 
I want to, mm -hmm. I want you to take risks. And if you really want me to be in a place, I'm going to block it out in my calendar. But if you're going to really do that, I want you to do it when you're trying something different or trying something new. I want you to take a risk and, um, you know, and, and then we'll go from there. Um, and just support them in the idea that if, if teachers are, if teachers are in the classroom, helping students with learning and trying to stretch themselves and getting better and do that, they're going to be making mistakes, just like students make mistakes. And I just work to really engage them to do that and support them to do that. Um, so that if, if something like that happens, I have no problem doing an observation and walking away and saying, all right, tell you what, we're just going to walk away from that and talk about how we get better next time. I'm not mm -hmm. going to put anything in writing or formalize anything right. or ding you on an evaluation because you're trying. That's, that's what I want. I want mm -hmm. them to try new things. So, well, it, you know, it, it's, it's actually interesting, uh, cause just, thinking about how that story is in context to my own work. So one of the questions I've been focusing on um, for years is how do we move from pockets of innovation to a culture of innovation? And so when you talk about that question, uh, it's like, okay, when I say pockets, like every school I believe has innovative things going on. But then the follow-up question I has, have is, if I was to come into your school, would you hide me from specific teachers? Or would you let me go anywhere? Because I should be able to go anywhere. And then I, I follow up, you know, and I think this is a really important aspect. It doesn't mean they never do worksheets. It doesn't mean that there's like, it's all the most incredible things 24 seven, right? And I think that is a very important distinction because like I always say, like sometimes I have to do tax forms as you do, but you know, I do those things, but I get to do really, I get, I get to do a job I love. I get to do really creative things, but sometimes you have to do the logistical things, right? right? Sometimes you have to do that process. What I don't want is that we're always doing the logistical things. I think that, that to me is, you know, I think that's one of the misconceptions is that it should be like drones 24 seven in classrooms. And I'm like, no, nah, that's, that's not what I mean at all. But like, what's the experience of kids? Do they say it's more empowering, engaging on the on, on a, the whole level? Or is that just kind of like a once in a while kind of thing, right? And so I think I think that I think that I really connected with that when you shared that. And I think there's something that you said at the end too, that I was going to ask you about. So when you encourage, uh, so actually, I'm gonna ask you two questions. And so the, the, second, one, the, the second one is more important than the first. Uh, so when you have when you're encouraging teachers take risks mm -hmm. what do, what happens when you if you encourage that what happens when it doesn't go the way that like some like the the concept of risk is that sometimes we don't know what the end point is and it could be not as good as we want so what how do you get people to a space where they take some risks things don't work out and then they feel in a space that they can actually continue to take risks after that fact I make sure I work with them um, on that, on the risk and what went wrong. And I try to foster a relationship or a trusting relationship where they can tell me when something went wrong um, or look to me to just talk something through. You know, sometimes people come and talk to you. They don't necessarily need your input or suggestion until they talk it through and they come to their own answers. Mm -hmm. uh, a really good example, we were doing a book club um, among faculty and one of the teachers gave students, you know, you hear all about 20% time and everything. Yep. Um, and it was the empower book that we were, we were doing. Yep. And so every Friday she gave her class, that class on that day to work on anything that interested them under her subject. She taught health, anything that interested the, them under her subject, just to tie it back to the, to the curriculum. And then they'd present on it afterwards. So she had everything from your trifold boards to PowerPoints, to a board game, things that kids created um, under these topics. And so I remember distinctly her sitting with me after and she rolled in this cart um, with all these projects and boards and stuff on it and everything. She rolled it and she goes, okay, so I tried this and it was awesome. She said, but I never thought about how I'm going to actually grade it. Right. So she had no way to grade because she had some that went way above board and then right. she had others that just kind of hit the minimum requirements, but still prove that they learned and they showed their learning. Mm -hmm. So we had to sit down and have a conversation about um, two things. One, how was she going to complete this issue with 
um, assigning a grade to the students because there's got to be a grade assigned and entered yeah. and how those discussions would go with the students. And then we discussed about, okay, so how do you make it better next time? Because you've got this, you're saying they were engaged. You're saying they were learning. You're saying that they showed you their learning. Mm-hmm. Isn't that what it's all about? So, so how do we make that better next time? And by better in this scenario, which is a lot of times what this has to do with, better in this scenario meant her being more comfortable with how she was going to assess what they received for a mark, which is a whole nother conversation right. between assessment and grading. Yeah. And that's one actually like what you talked about is one of the reasons I really push on this notion of evidence informed practice, not data driven, data informed. And I think that the terminology, the, the definition of data and evidence is actually very similar, but the perception of it is data is like everything I can like measure easily. Right. Whereas evidence, like I'm sure there is actually incredible evidence of learning and that teacher could provide that evidence through that process. But a lot of times the way we as- actually, I actually believe this is pretty much all the time, the way we assess drives our teaching, not the other way around. And so sometimes we like say, oh, teachers shouldn't teach the test, but then all we talk about is what the test scores are. And like, well, that's why they're teaching the test because that's all you focus on. And then you have a beginning of the year, you know, call to action about improving test scores. And then you're like, why are teachers teaching the test? And like, because that's all you talk about is the test scores, right? So I think that evidence of learning is, is really important. So I appreciate you making that connection. And so um, the the second question I have when we talk about risk taking, I'm really big on a encouraging people to take risks and in B then modeling. And so people can see that as an administrator, as a leader, we take risks ourselves. So like when you think about your practice, because it's, it's super easy for a boss to say, take risks who has no concern (laughs) of losing their job. Right. Yeah. Like when you're the boss, like who cares? So as a, as a principal, like, how do people know that you're taking risks in the stuff that you're doing that maybe you're trying? I actually have an idea of that based on just stories that you share, but like, is there something that comes to your mind when you, when you talk about that practice? Um, I model just about anything I ask them to do. So if we're like, our faculty meetings are different. They're not your typical faculty meetings. We do walking faculty meetings. We have discussions about stuff. And if whatever I ask of them, I always tell them that I go first mm-hmm. um, and I'll, I'll do whatever I'm asking of them first. The other way I do that is I'm, I'm usually trying different things, um, whether it's what I'm trying with communication strategies, newsletters, tech, anything like that. Right. And I will model it with them. So if I want them to try a new piece of tech, I put something together and use something with that tech to either just to um, present it to them or to send something out. Um, when I model and, and, you know, taking risks, right? Failure is part of taking risks. Yep. Um, when I do that or make a mistake, I'm the first one to raise my hand and say, hey, okay, look, so I got to walk this back because I made this mistake, Good. um, because I was trying this. So I'm going to, I'm going to try something different next time, um, and do that. So I make sure, I make sure modeling is super important, um, or, or central to how I ask them to do things. I, and I, and I, I so appreciate that. And I think it's actually something that should trickle down in classrooms, right. As well. Mm-hmm. So when I work with administrators, one of the things I say is like, Hey, there's some things that I'm probably saying today that you're not comfortable with, you're struggling with, you might agree with me, but you, you, you don't, you're not necessarily there yet. Right. Go talk to your staff about that. Say like, Hey, I saw this guy from Canada. Here's something that was really kind of like I was struggling with, but I need to kind of figure this out. So I'm going to kind of go through that process and, and and talk them through that, like show that you don't know everything that you're trying to figure some stuff out, but encourage your staff to do the same thing. Like I, I like if you as a staff member, as a teacher go in a classroom, you're in my PD session. I encourage staff to say like, Hey, if you don't agree with something I'm saying, if you feel uncomfortable, if you want to try something new, talk to your kids and say like, Hey, I was just doing this PD day. This is something that's new to me. I'm kind of unsure about it. I want to start maybe trying this because what are you modeling the kids, right? You're really modeling to kids what you're expecting from them. You're expecting them to try things they don't know. If kids walked into their classrooms knowing all the things we're going to teach them, then they don't need to come in, right? And I think part of that is, do they see you modeling that risk? Do they see you taking that risk yourselves? And uh, one of the things I always say is like, Risk is risk. I think people can connect it to um, inherent, inherently dangerous things, right? We're like putting kids at harm, and I'm that's not, I'm not that's not the risk we're talking about. 
what right. how I define risk is moving from a comfortable average in pursuit of an unknown better. How do we, you know, get away from the things that we've always done that might not work for kids and and try to find those better things. So I think I think I I love that you talk about that and I think it lends beautifully um to this concept that you're working on. I know you're having a book published and uh it will be out very soon after um this podcast is available to people and it's focused on this notion of teacher centered. And I've heard the concept learner centered. Uh, I connect that uh, a lot to my friend Katie Martin, who talks about um, the notion of learner centered. But like, what do you mean when you say teacher centered? Like, what what does that look like in a classroom? And I think I think most importantly, I know this is maybe kind of counterintuitive. How is that actually best for kids when you talk about that concept? No, that's that's perfect. And thanks for that lead. And I, you know. Uh, I, just one thing before I answer that, if you don't mind, the idea of you saying learner centered, um, teachers are learners if we're doing what we should be doing. So um, it all kind of ties in together. But the the whole idea of teacher centered, I I focus on supporting, engaging and empowering teachers in their work for a simple reason. Um, I'm looking for the biggest domino I can push over to have the most effect and to hit the most dominoes down. Um, and if my end goal is to make a, well, my end goal is to provide a better educational experience for everyone involved. Um, if I'm going to fulfill that, the only way I get to that many students is by affecting the teachers because they see the students every day. I don't, no matter how much I try or how many meetings I set up with them or anything like that. So the idea that if I create a culture where teachers know they're supported, they know they can take risks, they know that I'm there to support them, help them improve in their craft, that I can engage them in the atmosphere of the school, the whole culture of the school of continuous improvement, and then empower them to move forward on their own and make decisions. Um, who wouldn't want to work there, right? I mean, it's it's a work in progress. Um, but I don't want I don't want teachers sitting at home Sunday night going, oh God, tomorrow's Monday morning. What do I have first? I'm not expecting them to do cartwheels on the way in saying, yippee, we get to go to work tomorrow morning. But right. if they just say, hey, yeah, tomorrow's Monday. Cool. We've got this or this or this. If I put that teacher that feels secure, that feels supported um, and engaged in front of a class, there's no way the students don't learn because that teacher mm -hmm. is working in their passion. They're getting back to why they wanted to be a teacher and they're getting those skills across to students in a way that's engaging to the students. And if they're empowered to take risks, then students are going to be empowered to take risks because students, we, I mean, we just talked about the modeling thing, right? So if the right. students see the teachers taking risks and the teachers dealing with not having all the answers and discovering, um, then they're going to do it. And so then I'm going to get, I'm going to get a better result from, from all the, from all the students in the school well yeah i like we actually we went from in my last school district we 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 shifted away from the no, notion of like students you know like talking about students but we talked about learners and i think that was a really important aspect uh because it is seeing not not even just teaching staff but all of us right like our support staff or superintendents or trustees or our community as being learners and like we're we're doing this the the deal was though that um, if you were in a place where you're like, look, I've been doing this for 25 years, I don't need to learn anything, maybe we're not the place for you anymore, right? Maybe right. that's, right? Like if you feel you're done learning, you're probably done teaching because you know we, we always have new people coming in. Like we always have the variable of kids. Uh, kids are always a variable in our classrooms. They, they, they're no matter year after year after year, you're gonna have different dynamics in your classrooms, different personalities, and we have to learn, you know? You can't just like, I'm guilty of saying, you know, my first years, like you will adjust to me, right? right? Like that was that was my that was my kind of focus on, and you know, as opposed to like later on believing like I have to adjust to the people I'm serving, right? And I think that is important as an administrator, as a teacher. And what and I, you know what? I'm so glad you said that, and I'm I'm glad we're talking about that because, uh, I mean, you know, if you're the constant in education, you're in the wrong place. Because, right. you know, right. the needs are continuously changing. But, you know, oftentimes when I say teacher centered, sometimes, not oftentimes, but sometimes I get concerned because people think that means I automatically defend teachers to the hill. Teachers are doing great where they are. And we're just right. going to accept status quo where I'm actually the opposite of that. I'm I'm about continuous improvement. And a big portion of this whole framework is the idea of support. 
and mm-hmm. how I, I work with teachers to get them to where they need to be. And it's, it's about, you know, addressing obviously the things that they're doing great, encouraging them to do more. Um, but always that notion of we can always get better. And so how do we do that? And creating a map and helping teachers build a bridge to where they can become better because who doesn't like to be better at their job? Right. I mean, no teacher ever goes into school saying, Hey, you know what today? I, I, I I'm all set. I, I want to be bad today. Right. Um, if, if they could do better, just much like we talk with students, if they, if they could do better, they would. And so mm-hmm. it's my job um, to make sure that they're supported in getting better so that they can enjoy their job better. And it, and it trickles down to students, but it's definitely not a, it's not a soft shoe thing saying that, yeah. you know, the students are wrong and the, and the, the faculty's right. Yeah. And I think, I think right now, especially in education, teachers know, need to know they're supported, but they can grow through that process. Right. Like I, I know a lot of people and I can say this a little bit of myself. Um, sometimes we will leave places if we feel we're not growing anymore because we're like, yep. I, I crave getting better. Right. And I think that if I feel that I've outgrown a place, it's time to go. Like I've actually had to have that conversation with several people. It's like, you, you've outgrown this place. You got to go, you, you got to move on. Right. And because they're not they're, they're And I think a lot of times we, if we're being honest, we give so much attention to super negative people, uh, you know, maybe some of the issues that we have and then the people that are trying to do everything they can for kids, we just ignore them. Right. And just say, Oh, they're good. Right. Whereas they, they do crave that quite a bit. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to give you this opportunity here. Cause I know you're currently working on a book. I know you're kind of in the late stages of it. Um, and it's not out yet, but it's going to be out very soon. So just tell us about the book. Who's it for? And like, what, what do you hope people get from it? Sure. It's, um, it's with the publisher and we're starting the editing process, um, very soon. Um, so it'll hopefully be out the book. The, the whole idea of the book is it's, it's called seeing to lead, um, creating a world-class culture through a teacher centric approach. Mm-hmm. And the C and seeing stands for support, engage, and empower. So the book's broken up into sections about how to support teachers, why it's important, um, and then gives you some things to reflect on and gives you some steps to take things that you can do. And it follows that from supporting, which I had mentioned a little bit before about, you know, um, making sure teachers have the tools they need to improve, um, helping them up where they fall down, um, the whole idea of creating a map for improvement. Then, you know, moving on to engage, it talks about how to, you know, to engage teachers and different ways to engage teachers through technology and stuff. Um, about what's going on in their classroom, but more importantly, personalizing their vision um, to the school's vision. So showing them where they fit in the larger picture, which is important, what you were just saying about maybe this isn't the right place. Mm-hmm. Um, and then empowering them to to take those risks, to do different things in their classroom, to push education um, in a direction that's different from where we are now, because where we are now isn't good for where these students are going to be tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it's set up like that and it's got, it's, it's got personal anecdotes in it, stories that, um, have occurred to me where some of this has come to be because it was always, it was kind of nebulous and, and, um, the ideas were always out there, but as it crystallized and I really, um, I really got to my, what I call my just cause after the, the book, the infinite game, what I really cause call my just cause for education um, it, it became this idea of supporting, empower, engaging and empowering teachers. The book is for everybody. It's for, it's for leaders. Um, it's not a, a, it's not a difficult read or anything like that. Um, it's for leaders that want to improve their practice, um, or improve their culture, no matter where they are in their career. It could be a first year leader. It could be, um, a 10th year leader, a 20th year leader. And it's also for teachers because I want teachers to know that there are things that they could suggest to their leaders, they could try, they could help their leaders along. Um, so it really runs the gamut for for anybody that that wants to see a better educational environment. Love it, I love it. Okay, so I gotta, I'm gonna ask you this. I don't do this usually, okay? So I gotta figure out a name for the podcast, right? So okay. I have, so I'm gonna call this, teacher centered what like what i mean I, a teacher center has got to be in it yeah my the first thing that popped into my head was leadership 
Teacher center leadership. I love it. Okay. Hey, so I know let's, let's do this. How do you spell center? C E N T E R E D. Is that right? Okay. I don't know. I honestly don't know. There's like, I have to like, I kind of like go in this back and forth of like writing in uh, U S English and Canadian English. Right. So like That's... favorite. Right. So I don't know. I don't know. I would, I don't know if it's teacher C E N T E R E D. Right, as you said? Yeah. And so I think listen, that's right. I'm gonna put it, I'm gonna put it, and we're gonna see if Grammarly <laughs> says I'm wrong. Like, yeah, what, yeah, yeah, go. That's, I said I said my Grammarly to US, so there you go. That's I'm, that's I'm gonna I mean. give you I'm gonna give you 80 20. And you know, it's kind of like that whole spelling thing about um teaching <laughs> content instead of skills when we can look it up on Google. <laughs> right, right. You know, okay, okay. So okay, I got it. Teacher center leadership, love it. Okay. Yeah. So I've so appreciated your stories, but we talked about <laughs> we talked about wrestling before. Uh, you knew it was coming. Right? Yeah, yeah. So we kind of grew up in the same era, right? Yeah. Um, so we were WWF people, right? You quit watching it a little bit earlier, right? Mm -hmm. Who was your favorite wrestler of all time? Who's your guy? Oh, come on. Yeah, I want to know. Like when you well, think of I, like your favorite, if you say Hulk Hogan, I'm like, I, I'm not. I, was gonna, I, gotta oh, tell you. I knew it. I had, but I had a Hulk Hogan action figure even. <laughs> Um, right. I, when I, now when I was young, like middle school age, George, the animal steel was it. Right. Man. I, I liked him. Um, never cared too much for Sergeant Slaughter. Um, but, uh, uh, I, I gotta say Hulk had staying power. I liked the ultimate warrior too. Oh yeah. But I, yeah. I gotta say Hulk man, ripping his shirt off, doing pull-ups. <laughs> Remember was it? Big Jim, uh, big, how many, how many Jim was that? Yo, Billy Jim uh, was a good one. And, yeah. uh, and Uncle Elmer, right? I don't know if you oh, remember. I remember Uncle Elmer. A hillbilly, Jim, <laughs> hillbilly Jim. Okay, hillbilly Jim. And there was like he was like pretty big, and then they had Uncle Elmer, and he was like a big guy. And then they like they're yeah. And then I had like the WWF wrestling album, and it was like don't go <laughs> yes! with country boy. Yeah, it's like this is a theme song. Okay, Didn't so they come I come up with a couple of those. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Oh, I, had, had, like, I, had, 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 I, I wish I had that so bad. Like I actually had the, the vinyl wrestling album. That right? is funny. Okay. So I, I hated Hulk Hogan. Okay. I, you told me earlier. That's why I hesitated I to say it. Yeah, that's all good. But the, I remember because Saturday, like it was like, I slowly progressed into cartoons and it was like, and then it was like, they like took advantage of like middle school boys that, they just kind of had wrestling on later. So it was like, yep. kind of was like an easy transition. I don't know if you remember, they had like Saturday morning wrestler where wrestling was basically like a, a pretty popular or like a well-known wrestler versus like a no name kind of thing. And you always knew who would win. And then they'd have like one good match at the end. And I remember this distinctly, Paul Orndorff, Mr. Wonderful. He was good for a little bit. And then him and Hulk Hogan were like friends. And then Hulk Hogan, he was holding up Hulk Hogan's hand. And then he clotheslined him, and I was—that's I, I, the happiest I've ever been as a child. Just, <laughs> I was like, I was like, yes. And then I remember because his move. Do you remember Paul Orndorff? Do you remember him? I remember the name. Mr. I don't remember. Mr. Wonderful. And then, and then he like pile drived him. You're like, oh, because like, that was his finishing move. Yeah. And then this is like the crazy thing. He went outside. He removed the mats off of the ground so it was just concrete and then he pile drive hulk hogan on the concrete oh was, i don't remember that oh uh, it was like i i just because i was like that was on saturday morning wrestling i'll i like remember that look it up on youtube because it's I probably like it's like the blurriest thing i i remember I actually looked it up one day and it was like and it had that like little vcr line do you know what i mean yeah. where the where vcr i was like uh somebody like i probably saw it and blocked it out that's why i don't remember it <laughs> right <laughs> I subconsciously I erased it, it. All right. i like I, yeah i like talking about a little personal stuff so i appreciate you telling me that because i know you were uh you, you said you played football and i know it was amateur wrestling you didn't you know try to get into the wwf or anything like that but as soon you as know, you say wrestling i gotta talk wrestling i do have a question for you trivia <laughs> Who was the okay. small, balding, older guy announcer? Sometimes he did it with Gorilla Monsoon. His name was Gene or something like mean that. Mean Gene Oakland. It was Mean Gene Oakland. Okay. I was thinking oh, wow. Mean Gene. I was like, it can't be Mean Gene. Easy. But, easy. Yeah, Mean Gene Oakland. That was, yeah, because yeah. on the album, he sang Rock and Roll Hoochie Coo. <laughs> he did. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, actually, I think, so, um, 
this is this is i'm not 100 percent sure of this but hulk Hogan's theme song was like i'm a real american remember i am yep. a real, right and that and uh that was actually someone else's theme song and then hulk hogan took it i'm pretty sure no, about sir. That. i'm pretty sure i'm pretty oh, sure man. that there's like it was supposed to be i think it was like for sergeant slaughter or something like that so you are just tearing up oh. one of my childhood heroes <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah no <laughs> Yeah, and like when Hulk Hogan was bad, it kind of like it was kind of funny, but it was like interesting to see, uh, you know, all all, all of that. Um, like I said, Dark Side of the Ring is a really interesting show because, like, basically all wrestler, it was just like terrible time for people, right? Like it was like just yeah. the stuff that was kind of in there. So uh, I just had to talk a little bit of wrestling, so I thought it was kind of funny. But anyways, uh, hey Chris, it was awesome to get to know you, kind of sit and talk with you. So I told I told you this would be easy, right? Like we just talk, oh, yeah. right? Yeah, so, th this is the oh, best thing. I, I love it, man. So, hey, thanks for taking the time out of your busy day. I know I know that there's a million things you could be doing with your time right now. And so um, best of luck on the release of your book. I hope it does amazingly well. And I know, um, I'm sure a lot of teachers listening to this are so appreciative uh, of really kind of making sure they feel supported in a time where they honestly need it the most. I'm sure many people say that. So thanks, thanks so much for being on the podcast today. No, thank you. I really appreciate you giving me the time. And uh I, I look forward to talking again sometime soon. That'd be great. All right. Thanks, All right. everyone, for listening. Have a wonderful day.